I'm Lisa Vealy, and I'm Lizzie's mom, and Lizzie has cerebral palsy. When Lizzie was born, I felt lost. I felt like no one else had a child like Lizzie, and I felt like I needed to find some support. That's why the CP Family Network has created an online TV show just for you. It's a place for you to go and get questions answered, get ideas, and have discussions with other families and get support for your daily life. Hi, I'm Lisa, I'm Lizzie's mom, and Lizzie has CP. I also have two other children, so staying organized is very important. And keeping up with doctor's appointments and medicines is a tough job, and it can be um, a part-time job. So what I've decided to do is I decided to keep um, my life in a binder. And the CP Family Network has come up with a care guide that can help you stay organized as well. Their care guide is very good information for you to have when you're traveling, on vacation, or just to have in the car if you're going to a doctor's appointment. Let me tell you some information that comes in the care guide. Pharmacy information, public health providers, family support providers, a medication list that you can write all the medications that your child is on. They do ask that every time you go to the doctor's office, so that's a good, good, good list to have. Um, an equipment list. Lizzie has a stroller, she has a walker, she has you know, a bath chair. There's several, several things that she has on her equipment list. And just everyday living instructions for you, a daily schedule, uh, how to deal with stress, um, nutrition, sleeping. And so this is very good information to have. One important thing that I carry with me is a binder pouch, and that keeps all of the physician's orders, and it also can keep prescriptions uh, together um, so I know where everything is and it's not stuffed into the bottom of my bag where everything tends to die. Um, so this is a very important thing to have in your binder because it keeps everything organized from, you can have several different ones from the neurologist, you can have one from the pediatrician, you can have one from your, you know, orthopedist. Um, these are very good to have. And one important thing to know is that moms and dads in our community helped create the care guide. So we're looking to you again to help us update it, to add, to take away things, um, and just to help us make it better. So you can go to cpfamilynetwork.org and help us make it better. there's two arms of this. There's people who are trying the trials like me and the other people I talked about and we have an idea about that but truthfully we're kind of throwing mud at the wall and seeing what sticks. The first pass that most of us ran into from the basic science guys was that this was not designed as a trial that will lead to an understanding of the mechanism of action and uh, they, the advice was wait until we figure it out then go and I'm thinking, well, I'm sitting in the clinic and I'm seeing these kids come in and I'm not really waiting to, I'm not ready to wait 10 years until you come up with something. I'd like to push it forward. And so very recently, there's been some really exciting basic science stuff that's come out that makes it look like we're getting closer to understanding what's happening. Once we get to mechanism, lots of cool things happen. You'll know what kind of cells to use. You'll know maybe if you're seeing an effect, whether there's some medication you could add to the cell therapy that might enhance it. Um, you get an idea about timing, about when you should use the cells, how often you, sh you should use the cells. Uh, on the clinical side, we're figuring out how many cells to use. That's something that we can help a lot. And I think that's why you do research is because you don't know. And you know, you, you sometimes you, you crack a lot of eggs before you get to anything meaningful. But if you don't try, you won't move forward. And, and that's where we are, I think, collectively as a translational research community looking at cerebral palsy. Let's get going. Let's try some stuff and see. If it doesn't work, okay, but if it does, man, let's run with it because these kids are being born every day and you know, you want to really work hard to try and help them have a better life and make life a little bit better for their families.
If you want to help, um, there are foundations that specifically review grant proposals and fund them. Let's Cure CP is one of them. Um, and you can look into those groups. If you support them, uh, what they do is they review grants just like the NIH reviews grants and decide whether it's grant worthy. They decide whether the budget is legitimate. And they also usually um, you know, provide some kind of oversight watchdog type function and make sure people aren't you know, run off with the money. Uh, most of the people who are engaged in this kind of research, the people I know, are really pretty passionately committed to it. They're really decent people trying real hard to make things work. You know, uh, on the phase one trials, pretty much all the professionals donate their time. They negotiate discounted fees for basically everything under the sun that's involved in this study. No one's getting rich off it. Um, the truth is, though, for the trials that we're doing, deeply discounted costs, no doctors getting paid, it's still half a million dollars to treat 10 kids. That's just how it works in this day's medical economy. So um, when I started out, I thought, well, that's crazy, a lot of money, and then start the fundraising function, which is, you know, um, convincing people that you're someone that they can trust to, to give that kind of money to is pretty challenging. And I think that Let's Cure CP is a nice filter because they know us, they talk to us, they've pretty well vetted us, and if they're signing off on it, the chances of goodness happening is high, the chances of badness happening is low, and I think that's a great place to go if you want to. So I think another important thing for the Cerebral Palsy Family Network to consider is to becoming politically engaged. And I'm not talking about, you know, lighting your hair on fire and burning down the capital of whatever state or country you're working in, but I think to constructively embrace the agenda that we're trying to promote here, which is to m make life better for kids with CP and also to do meaningful research that could assist in that end. And you can get involved with your local political, uh, political um, representatives and it's a pretty simple process. What you do is phone up and you start the conversation off by asking to speak to whoever in the representative or senator's office works on healthcare related issues. And when you get to that person, you say, I am a registered voter in your district, which translates into, hey, you work for me. And <laughs> these are some things that are really important to me. And then you just list it out. And then I, I think the, the other part of it is to, in, 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 as an organization, embrace the NIH and the FDA and help support them in their agenda, because times are tough with budget cutting and um, um, money allocation. And I think, from my from from my point of view, the money that's spent by the NIH is one of the very best things the U.S. government does. It really helps us all. Um, and uh, so, whatever it is that you can do to help them as well. Um, they will want, I think, structured and constructive input from you. And if you can respectfully uh, communicate with both your elected officials and the government entities that, that are overseeing this activity, I think everything gets better. A lot of children with CP um, struggle with constipation issues because muscles are weak, all of their muscles are weak, including those. So um, our, he's rubbing his belly. Um, what we do is we rub his stomach to be able to help get his digestion going, and this is something his physical therapist has shown us. For his stomach, um, we, we also use peppermint because that's supposed to help um, aid in digestion. So I, I use the peppermint oil on his stomach. The way your, your intestines run is from when you're looking at your child from the left to the right all the way around. So if he gets a blockage, I can feel it even sometimes. There'll be a hard spot there. So I will take and put the peppermint on his stomach and you don't want to push hard on their stomach. <laughs> if they, it, it, that can be painful. So go really slow if you're going to do something on their stomach because um, you don't want them in pain. Um, but then you can just begin to do little circles like in a clockwise motion around their belly button. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if you find that hard spot um, where they may have a blockage, um, you can just just slowly add the pressure. <laughs> slowly add the pressure to it to see if you can help them get some relief without causing them pain. Um, so that is what we do with him. Uh, again, get your physical therapist to show you how to do it and let them watch you doing that on their stomach as well um, to make sure that 
that we're, we're doing it the way we should. Um, but that's what we do for him, and he is a little excited now. Oh. He's all rested. <laughs> His muscles are ready to go and play some more. <laughs> talk to you about switches. What you're going to need is a container to put it in. We just looked around the house and found that we had a little barrel of monkeys, dumped them out, and my brother um, was able to drill a hole and put them in there, put the button in there. So the other parts that you're going to need will be the button that you can order. Um, you can order this on Amazon. He found it there and it's less than six dollars. Um, that switch is called a it's called a UX Cell Arcade Game 52 millimeter. You can order the color that you want to order. You'll also, the rest of the items that I'm going to show you, you'll be able to get at your local um, auto parts store. You will need um, 18, it comes in a pack as 18 to 22 gauge wire. So you'll need that. The connectors that you'll use with the wire it's going to be color coded red. That means that it all the colors are based on the size of the wire that they fit. So you'll need the red connectors. This connector is a quarter inch insulated disconnect, and it looks like this. There are very there are quite a few sets in there, and it just they connect together. So you'll have one end on your button, and the other end is going to be on the toy. And it comes with several sets, so you'd be able to to do more than one. Um, the next part that you're going to need is called a quarter inch female disconnect and again that is red and it looks like this. The last pack you'll need is called the butt connectors and they look like this. This is what you use um, in connecting it within the toy. You will need a set of small screwdrivers. Um, my husband happened to already have those here. That's going to help you open up the toy to be able to get to the battery. And the last thing that you'll need is a stripper, crimper, and wire cutter. Okay, to get started on making our button, you're first of all going to figure out what you want to put your button in. What do you want to attach it to? What's going to get it to the right height that you want? So we found that we had these little, this little set of nested blocks. And actually there's going to be quite a few that we would be able to use if we wanted to. Um, so I took that block and I cut a hole in the top. This is where the button is going to slip through. And then I also cut a little hole in the side so that the wires can come through. So now that we have our block ready, all we have to do is take the button that we ordered and turn it upside down. And this part just twists and you can pull it right out. We lay that to the side. And there's another part that has um, like a little plastic bolt that's on there and you just unscrew that. And then that will slip right inside of your box and even screw so you can screw it in. And then turn it over. You want it to get all the way down on there. Um, then if you turn it over, you'll be able to see where you need to screw this piece back on. And screw it with the flat side to the top and just get it nice and snug. Okay, and now our box, our container, is ready to go. Um, you'll also see from here that I've already cut two pieces of wire. Um, and this is going to be the piece that runs just like you see on this button. The piece that comes out and will connect to the toy. Uh, so cut those. And I've practiced <laughs> stripping the wire. I do suggest that you practice on a piece of wire, um, not the toy. Um, get this part down pat before you decide to cut the wire on the toy and strip it. Um, so my husband gave me a lesson in this last night. All you have to do is, um, we're only going to strip, I guess, like a half an inch there. Um, if you click and you can pull through, then it's not tight enough. You just keep going until you get to one where it will grab. And so we found that this one is where it will grab. Squeeze tight. 
and then it just pulls right off. So we're going to do this on all four, all, both ends of each wire. And then on one end, so that you can connect to the button, you're going to put this quarter inch female connector on there. And all you have to do for that is you'll push that little wire into the connector. And then this button where we had the, um, the light that comes off, all you have to do is you'll see there are two prongs there. You take each of those connectors that you have adapted and you're going to fit it right onto that prong. I don't want to do it because it does not like to come back off once it goes off. So you'll just crimp that on and that stays on both of those, those um, connectors there. So that's what that end, one end of each wire goes on there. So after we do that, now that we've got this completed, we can take and connect it inside of the toy, the button. And then we'll need to push the wire through that hole um, so that we can connect the other. Just pull that wire through. If you look in there, you can see that's more of a flat line. If you can see. Um, but in here, it just kind of loops around so that it can grab onto this and hold it. So we're going to grab the one that loops around. And again, making sure that's a flat one. I don't want that one. I want the one that loops around. I'm going to bend it over at the end. Push it in until it goes as far as it can. All right. So now we have our button. All we need now is to adapt the toy so that this button can just plug right into the toy and then the child will have something that they're going to be able to activate the toys with. I think the other thing I wish I had known was about the stay put because I go into those meetings mm -hmm. so many times thinking, oh my gosh, my, entire, my child's entire education is on my shoulders. If I blow this, he's not going to benefit from his education. Mm -hmm. Tremendous stress. But I found that little stay put mm -hmm. clause. I was dancing around the living room. My husband's <laughs> laughing at me like, yeah, you're crazy. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it, it means the stay put clause was put in by the federal government to say that um, you can't you can't change a child's plan back and forth if it's going to be appealed and you're saying I don't want you to because that's the thing they've always wanted to take OT and PT occupational therapy and physical therapy out of his plan um, and it, rather than have the school take that out of the plan and then you appeal it and win and put it back in that child's gone up and down the, the, the they've taken things away and now he's been without it and then they put it back in because you win so what the federal government says is there's a stay put clause if it's in dispute leave it the way it is let's just go through the, the appeals process and then if the school wins then you can take it out so now you go into a meeting and you know that all you have to do is if they call they start talking about something that you were not aware of you just can say, you know, I, I want to dispute this. Write it in your notes, please, because there'll be a note taker there. Tell them you want it put in the notes that I dispute taking occupational therapy out of my child's plan. Therefore, the federal law says you can't take it out. If you, and then usually the school will say, yeah, we don't want to appeal that. Mm -hmm. We, okay, mom, we'll let you have that. <laughs> That's the way to do so, it. Yeah. <laughs> So when I went to register him for uh, Fox Meadows the second year, um, they told me that he, they had transferred him to a uh, shrine. And I felt that I was very disappointed that they did that without even contacting me and letting me know uh, that they changed my child to another school. And it was a school specifically for children with special needs only. And I thought that he would be better off in a school that inclu inclusive, that included all children. I never heard of the stay put rule. I wish I had known about that uh, when Jordan was switched from Fox Meadows to Shrine because uh, that rule would have allowed me to keep Jordan in an inclusive school where he could have developed 
a lot more than he developed that shrine. For more resources for families affected by CP, sign up for our newsletter at cpfamilynetwork.org and don't forget to like us on Facebook.